Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Katie Rothley and I'm a librarian here at the Lyon Township Public Library. I'm happy to answer any library questions you may have. You're welcome to use the chat function in your Zoom to ask any questions at any time throughout the presentation. Uh, and I want to thank you all for joining us tonight for tonight's Mystery of Need talk with author Laura. And especially want to give a hearty thank you to Laura for taking the time to spend an evening with us. I'm going to do a little talking before I turn it over to, to Laura. And then if you see me pause for a little bit, it's because I'm admitting more um, participants into our Zoom meeting. So uh, just bear with me if I do that. Um, we are recording the Zoom event. Uh, and we'll be spotlighting our presenter, Laura, but feel welcome to either turn your video off or turn it on so she can see your face. I know um, it's a little more difficult with these um, virtual events because we're not in person and, uh, and we don't get to see everyone's faces. Um, so we understand and you can keep your video off. That's perfectly fine. Um, I am going to keep everyone muted. Please use the raise your hand function or the chat option to ask questions or request to be unmuted uh, to ask a question to Laura directly, but most of the questions are going to just go through me. You can find the chat in the bottom middle of your Zoom screen. There should be a little um, chat icon. If you click on that, a little screen will pop up to the right of the Zoom window and that you can type in. Um, if you're calling in from a phone, I don't see any right now, but just uh, just want to put it out there that you're right here. Um, welcome to ask questions too. And I will mute you once you have finished asking the question. So this is just to keep things flowing and distractions to a minimum. I also want to let you know if there's anything disruptive during the Zoom meeting, whether through sound or video, it may result in your dismissal. Uh, we just want to make sure everyone can enjoy this shared event in a comfortable and safe online environment. So I am monitoring the chat. I will ask Laura questions in the order that they appear in the chat. And then you may notice that I may mute you if for some reason your audio is turned on or unmute you if you have used the raise, um, raise your hand function or put it in the chat. <clears throat> So now I want to invite you to participate in some of our upcoming virtual events. Uh, please consider joining us tomorrow evening for our long-awaited virtual author visit with Dirk Vector on the topic of Kent State, his graphic novel. This is our Neighborhood Library Association animal, uh, animal, <laughs> excuse me, annual community reads pick, and we collaborate with several local libraries in this metropolitan area to read and discuss one book a year. And then we bring the author on to chat with our community. So registration is required for this event through Novi Public Library. Um, and so if you just do a quick search for Novi Public Library in Google uh, and look for their event calendar, you can register on there. Then Saturday, November 14th at 11 a.m., University of Michigan Museum of Natural History will be virtually teaching about dinosaurs and paleontology. And our youth librarian will also be leading us in a weaving craft at 2 p.m. also on Saturday, November 14th. So registration is required for all of these events. Um, the two that I mentioned on Saturday, uh, registration is available in our event calendar on our website at www.ltpl.org. Lastly, we welcome your feedback, if you don't mind, in the form of a short survey to share your experience with us tonight and any ideas or topics for future events that you'd be interested in attending. We appreciate everything that is shared with us and we take it into consideration when we're planning future programs. I'll include the survey link in the chat for you to access throughout this presentation at your leisure. Uh, we did switch our event calendar um, over to a new system, so we don't have the ability to email it out anymore automatically. Um, so this is the best way to do it, but also if you go onto our website and visit the event calendar, there's a link available there at any time as well. So now um, I want to introduce our guests. Laura Ngadi has been making need 
for over 30 years, focusing on finding, understanding, and recreating needs from historical recipes. Her goal is to share the fascinating and complex history of mead through its 9,000 year worldwide history, particularly the complex interactions of mead making with economic, agricultural, social, and political history, and the enormous variety of ingredients, flavors, and techniques in, um, from historical recipes. She has cataloged over 3,200 mead recipes dating from before uh, 1750 CE, and has made and tasted over 100 of these. Laura uses her training in engineering and biology from MIT and Northeastern University, as well as professional experience in the techno-economic <laughs> analysis slash modeling, industrial fermentation and water treatment to weave together the threads of history and connect the past with the present. Laura writes about her work at www.mysteryofmead.com, no spaces, dashes, or anything, and Mystery of Mead on Facebook. Her books on historical mead, um, one is called Welcome Mead and Cider, and this one is called Cider and Perry in Britain to 1700, are available on Amazon. Welcome, Laura. Thank you very much. Um, if you share the stream, we can go straight to the presentation, but before I go too far, I'd like to say, please ask questions at any time. Um, I, I find the best, the best talk is when your questions guide where we, where we go with the discussion, because I'd much rather be talking about things that you find interesting. Um, and it won't bother me at all to get interrupted with, with questions or follow-ups on that. Um, do you want to share my screen in? Uh, or, okay, so I think you have to do that on your end. Okay, oh yes, here we go. I for, I'm sorry, I-, I Oh no, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Here. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. So we're here not tonight to talk about mead. Um, hopefully you're all at least slightly aware that mead is defined by the use of honey as a sugar to ferment to make an alcoholic drink. But what a lot of people don't know is that mead has an identity as the oldest fermented drink. But that's a little bit of an exaggeration. Actually, the oldest fermented drink was a mix of different things. It had fruits and grains and honey in it. Because when people first discovered this amazing thing called fermentation that made a mind-altering su substance, they decided they wanted to do it. But coming by the sugars to do so wasn't always easy. So they'd make what um, a very well-known drink historian named Patrick McGovern out of the University of Pennsylvania calls grog, which is his way of saying they found whatever sugars they could find, wherever they could find them, put them together, fermented them, and then drank them. But mead is a particularly interesting to me for a number of reasons. The other, it's really close. It has a history that matches beer and wine, but it's always been less of a major drink in one way or another in various places. And while we have a lot of information on the history of beer and a lot of information on the history of wine, there hasn't been as much study of the concerted actual history of mead. So that's what caught my attention is, and has been uh, gathering my, uh, my work for a very long time now. So mead also has these amazing associations in people's brains with legend. It shows up across the world. The Rig Veda, which is a Indian uh, mythological, is part of the, uh, actually one of the founding, foundational texts of Buddhism. We have Beowulf, the Anglo-Saxon. We have Chaucer, we have the Viking sagas. And actually what people don't, may not, one of the little known facts is the, the old, one of the, probably the most established long-term tradition of mead making that I can show a continual 2000 year history 
is actually from Ethiopia in Africa, where there is a drink called tej, which is honey, water, and the bark of a tree called gesho. And that is mentioned in Roman era writings and continues to be a popular drink in Ethiopia today. So there, so we can see this drink appearing across the world, that 9,000 year old history, that first drink, and the earliest we currently have documented was actually done by scientific analysis of the residues in the pores of a clay jar uh, excavated from a site in China. So we have, now what I talk about today is probably going to be fairly European centric because that's where we have a lot of very good records that are more readily available. Um, but we, I try never to forget that the history of this drink is, tr is really worldwide. There's evidence that it was drunk in South America by the uh, pre-Columbians before with the Native American honeybee, uh, which has since been mostly displaced by the European honeybee. So we hear about mead when we hear about modern things, Ren Fairs, Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, there's a well-known video game, Skyrim, which speaks of mead. And a lot of people have gotten into mead by playing these games and hearing about it and saying, oh, well, I'll try making it. So what I like to talk about is the history of mead and not so much the history through what was said about it, but how it was made and what that drink did in the lives of the people who were consuming it and what, what its status was and how it was made and what the ingredients were and making it and figuring out what it may have tasted like. Uh, as as um, Katie said in the introduction, I started life as an engineer. Um, so my approach to things is very much, I, I've often introduced myself by, I need to let you know I'm an engineer and that explains a lot about things. Um, and most people laugh and, and, and get it. And I found that this history and this learning about mead is, is very much the same as engineering. You look at things, you figure out the connections and the causes. So, um, but today, rather than talking too much about the, the nitty gritty of the making of the, making of the mead, um, I'm gonna touch on that, but I'm really gonna talk about that history, that 9,000 year history and how it developed and how it changed as the world around it changed and how we see that reflected in what people were drinking. So this is where I tweak people who are fans of wine and beer. In my opinion, mead is by far the most versatile fermented drink out there. Why? We're starting with something that's 80% sugar. Uh, honey is, is is actually has too much sugar in it to ferment itself. I have a jar of honey in my basement that somehow reappeared after about 20 years and it's still liquid and it's still sitting there and it hasn't changed at all and no special treatment. Um, meat, honey that's hundreds of years old has been found in places and it's essentially unchanged because it's so concentrated with sugar that nothing can really grow in it. But when you dilute it, it forms a perfect environment for the growth of Saccharomyces cerevisiae or yeast, which produces as a, in one of its major products of life, alcohol. So with mead, when we choose how much honey we put in at the start, we can choose how much alcohol we get out at the end and how sweet or dry the resulting product is. Some mead is super sweet, some is, has no sugar at all left in it. It can have a very low alcohol, it can have a wine-like strength or even a little stronger. Based on what kind of honey we put in, we change the flavor of it. We can use different kinds of yeast, we can add different things to it, all different kinds of flavors. And so mead has a variety that is simply amazing which is why meat is amazing, but is more than just the variety. The honey itself is this mystery. Um, 
being an engineer, I did the calculations. A cup of honey is about a million flowers worth of nectar. That's a lot of work, a lot of bees. And that mystery of honey and fermentation probably explains the value that's been placed on wine, beer, and mead throughout history as an item that shows wealth and richness. Its ability to dispense it in feasts shows the status of the person who is hosting. The alcohol as a lubricant for social interaction is well known. And when we look at the history of that, we see that some things change and th some things don't change and, and the world circles round. Mead for the last hundred years has not been a well-known drink, but yet in the last 10 years, it started to explode. 10 or 15 years ago, there were um, a few dozen, 40 or 50 meaderies in the US. Today, there are several hundreds. It's the fastest growing segment of the fermented drink market. And when I say fermented, I'm drawing a line between fermented wine, beer, cider, mead, which are served as, as they're made and distilled where you take a fermented drink and then concentrate the alcohol. Um, I draw that distinction. So we see time flowing back and forth and and things changing, but yet at, at the same time, the way we make mead today is essentially the same as those Chinese villagers were following 9,000 years ago when they made their drink. So just to add a little bit more context, I study the period up to about 1750 in the common era because I don't want to get too modern. I focus on the recipes because I like to make mead, I like to drink mead. But I found that in that process, to really understand what they were making, I had to understand a lot more. I had to understand how they measured their volumes, what they called things, why they called them that, why it was that there were certain parts of the world that mead was made in and others where it was less common. You know, a good example is Mead is much better known for northern climates because grapes don't grow as well. Mead has a very strong presence in England and in Germany and in uh, Russia. And those are places where there was, relatively speaking, ready availability of honey compared to other sources that could be used as fermenting sugars. I also am being very technical minded, like to look at the facts as opposed to the supposition. Um, one of these days, there's a lot of people, everyone's heard, probably has heard the story that a honeymoon is the first 30 days of a marriage and that a couple would, it's called the honeymoon because they would drink mead and hopefully have a good start to their wedding. I have not been able to trace that back further than about a hundred years. I don't know. I'm still working on it, but one of these days I'll figure it out. But I have a suspicion that this might be a Victorian or later fancy that has caught everyone's imagination as this ancient tradition that very well may not be an ancient tradition. So as I said, the basics of mead making, just to give us a, a grounding here, essentially all you truly need to make mead is honey, water, and yeast. And even the yeast you don't necessarily have to add intentionally because there's yeast all around us floating through the air. In fact, anyone who's ever made and kept a sourdough starter has done exactly that. They've captured the yeast that's in the environment around them and brought it to their own purposes. And beyond that, we can add pretty much anything we want to it. We can add spices, we can add fruits, we can add herbs, we can add grains. We can add some things that probably shouldn't be added to mead. I did, I saw the recipe, I had to try it. Horseradish mead. 
not, it was interesting. That's what we say. It was, it was interesting. I'm not sure I'm making that one again. How do I find information? This is something that I love because when I first started doing this research into old recipes, uh, I, I found a set of 400 reels of microfilm. Hopefully some of you, most of you know what that is at the university library. And it had a paper catalog and that was a microfilm of 400 reels of books before 1700 called early English books. Now, these days, it's early English books online. And I'm not sure any of those libraries still have the microfilm. I spent months going through that, the indexes and the microfilms and finding sources and printing them out. And when I got back to this a few, uh, five or so years ago, I went online and I Googled. And it's amazing what you can find. The number of libraries that have placed materials online especially materials like what I'm looking for, which are 700 years, several hundred years old and are completely out of copyright. Uh, I've, I've been to libraries in Eastern Europe where they've placed manuscripts online that you can find and download a PDF and review it at your leisure. You learn to look for things that are learn the rhythms of the types of things. And with me, this has been kind of difficult. Depending on who you're talking to, mead might be cooking, which is done inside the house in a kitchen. It might be brewing like wine or cider, which is done outside the house as a part of agriculture. It might be a mystery because fermentation is in and of itself to someone 300 years or more ago this thing that just happens is a complete mystery. So fermentation is, is a mystery. And therefore it goes with almost with alchemy. It could be a matter for health. We is something we eat and drink. And as part of what we eat and drink, it can also be a carrier of medicine. So therefore it might be in a medical manual. You find, interestingly enough, you'll find travelogues. Some of our very earliest references to Mead come in Greek and Roman books about the world they saw around them. And they would report that the people in the northern lands drink this drink made from grain. Because of course the Greeks and Romans were very focused on their wine. And that's how we know that the Germanic tribes were documented to be drinking beer in the years, B, their late years BC. So let's go back to our timeline. We start 7,000 BC in China. We see comments here and there. Uh, many people who know something about beer history are familiar with there's a um, Sumerian tablet which has on it a writing called the Hymn to Ninkasi, which is the earliest written recipe that's been written down for, in this case, beer. And that recipe calls for adding the sweet liquor, which some people think is honey. Some people actually think it was probably a, a palm sugar instead of honey. But if it was a honey, then that makes it the earliest written recipe as well for a mead. We see, as I said, the Rig Veda, which is a uh, old Indian a uh, subcontinent Indian religious tract speaks multiple times of mead in a religious context, as do the uh, Norse sagas and religious gods, how Odin and their gods were involved with mead. And the picture here is actually from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And this was a tomb offering of a model and this is a combined Egyptian brewery and bakery side by side because both were using the grain in one case to make bread and in the other to make beer. We start seeing a lot more written about mead when we hit the Greek and Roman timeline. In fact, a name that we see for quite some time is Dioscorides, who was the first herbalist 
he wrote a book called De Materia Medica, which goes through several hundred herbs and other materials, describing each one, talking about their properties, and then telling us what they're useful for in medicine. This book was the core of herbalism for, over, for almost 1,500 years. More, more people have also heard of Pliny, who's, um, who wrote about his travels and the world around him. Interestingly enough, the bits in Pliny and Dioscorides about need are similar enough that they probably both came from a previous older writing that's now been lost. And we see this a lot. Plagiarism, adaptation, borrowing wording or material wholesale was absolutely common through the, uh, the, uh, up through the entire period that I study and arguably up through the current day. So I'm also going to talk a little bit about different types of mead, because I've said that one of the interesting things about mead is the number of things we can add to it. Uh, we call in the modern days mead to which we've added fruits, we call them melomels. Historically, there's a lot of other names for those, made with grapes, quinces, apples, mulberries, other fruits. The in the 17th century and 18th century, the Russians were very well known for making meads with various kinds of fruit. Most of the people who visited Moscow on either trade or political delegations comment about the amount of mead that was drunk in the Tsar's court. A lot of modern meaderies use um, fruit, fruit, make fruited meads. In, and they're not necessarily as sweet as you always think. Some of them can be very sweet. One of the recipes that I make is from a recipe that was first written down about 350 AD by a Roman agricultural writer known as Palladius. And he combines pomegranate juice with honey and then ferments that. And that one actually comes out very sweet, but it doesn't taste as sweet as you think because the tartness of the pomegranate juice balances the honey very well. And I, lo I love to serve that to people and tell them that they're drinking something that's made from a 1700 year old recipe. So we see through that entire, that through that long period where we don't, before printing became common in Europe, those Greek and Roman texts are continued. They're copied, they're recopied, they're compiled, they're added to. And that Greek and Roman knowledge does continue to dominate thought through most of that period. We do see some development. Um, we see things like the English, what they call leech books, which are a particular Anglo-Saxon form of medical manuscript. And we see bits and pieces of the first cookbooks coming out. One, one of the quotes here, Das Buch von Gutterspeise, which is a German cookbook of about 1350, written in Würzburg, Germany. And this was one of the very first uh, historical recipes that I tried to figure out with my, with, uh, my friends, figured it out and made. And just to prove, we, we made that recipe for the first time over 25 years ago. And it was just last month that I found, we, I've always looked at this, if you look at this quote, boil that with the wart against half a mile. And then later in the recipe, it says boil it a mile, uh, an acre and back. And we had always wondered what boiling something an acre and back, back meant. And we had figured that it meant, okay, well, how about the time it takes to walk around an acre of ground, which would be about 10 minutes, five or 10 minutes. And it seemed like a decent amount to, to boil something for. And just last month, I was reading something and it turns out that there is a technical definition for an acre and back 
and it relates to the meaning of the word furlong. And so after 25 years, I have learned something that tells me uh, that may give a definitive clue of what they actually meant in terms of time when they said boil it an acre and back. Uh, and that's one of the joys of this work is you're always, there's always something else to learn. And if you are a fan, if you are a fan of rabbit holes, there are more than enough for you. Uh, my husband, a few last month was watching an archeological show from the other room and yells to me across the house. That's what was it? 1378 Brewer's Book Norwich. Now it turns out that the reference was not actually to a Brewer's Book, but it was to a city ordinance from Norwich, England, which talks about how brewing and yeast was managed as a almost communal property because every time someone brewed something or made bread, they needed fresh yeast. So yeast would get passed around the community as a resource that was pretty much available to all. And this ordinance regulated the price that could be charged for that so that it wouldn't be hoarded or otherwise limit people's access to it. We talked, I talked a little bit about medicine. This is something about that herbalism and that medicine that's critical. From the time of Dalen, which is well over 20, about 2,500 years ago, and through all the way into the 18th century was this idea of health that associated everything, these properties, hot, dry, cold, hot, cold, wet, dry, and that by combining these qualities, we define matters of health and diet and people's character. And so balancing these humors, the humor theory, was critically important in both medicine and diet for well over a thousand years. And we see this reflected in mead recipes where you'll see a list of herbs that are used and all of them are cold and wet or hot and dry because to add herbs that were from contrary would negate their effectiveness. And in fact, one of the types of mead made with these herbs is called metheglin, which is actually an old Welsh word and has the meaning of a medicinal liquor. A lot of us associate mead with the Vikings. Uh, and we've seen the, uh, the mead halls and the feasting and certainly that uh, boisterous uh, drinking to excess and then going out and fighting the next day is more than adequately reflected in the Viking sagas and stories. But the truth is we don't really know how common mead truly was in that particular culture or what the specific ingredients other than honey and water were. We can surmise because we know what they ate. We have evidence from archeology. span We have other, other evidence, but right now we can't be sure, which of course leaves it wide open. Uh, for people to suppose and make their own Viking, Viking meads to drink. The most common addition historically and probably in the modern day to mead is spices of various kinds. Cinnamon, ginger, cloves, nutmeg. Um, when I look at my catalog of recipes, four of the top five additions are spices. And after you've run through the main spices, the the ones, the, uh, the ingredients that are after that become much less common. And spices were, again, a matter of mystery through most of these ages. They came overland, uh, many from the Far East, although some of these, if you look at this list, grains of paradise are actually come from the Guinea po coast of Africa. Um, and these are flavors which a lot people have become more familiar with as, as uh, palettes have expanded over the last few decades, but some of them have truly uh, unique flavors. Uh, one of my favorites is long pepper, which if you get a chance to find it, 
It is, has very much the character of black pepper, but has an aromatic overlay to it, which is very pleasant. Then we get the printing press, which changes an awful lot in Europe. They start out reprinting these Latin texts and commenting on them and compiling them and changing them. But then we start seeing a shift to more topical, more modern for them topics. And this, a lot of this is because as, as, those Lat, as those old Latin and classical texts are reprinted, people in large parts of Europe, Germany, France, the Netherlands, England, find that that Mediterranean focused knowledge doesn't work as well for them as, as you would think. So they start thinking and writing about their local knowledge, their local cuisine, their local environment, their local plants. And we start seeing books about cooking, farming, and health that are more locally based for those people and have newer information in them. And that's where you really start seeing the explosion in mead recipes and a change. And one of the things we see, and I've alluded to this, is this idea of secrets. As knowledge expands and the study of science, we hit the Renaissance and the study of science begins. There's this idea of things that are mysterious. And it can be as simple as getting stains out of clothes. That's a mystery. That's a secret. Heaven knows I sometimes can't get my stains out of my clothes. And fermentation is that mysterious. Math, economics, these things that, and we see, and some of it gets extraordinarily bizarre. I, I picked this picture here from a manuscript that's in the collection of Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and this is fermentation. I have no clue what this uh, drawing is trying to show. I hope it was meaningful to the person who spent their time um, drawing it, but I thought it was interesting, so I added it to the uh, presentation. Regionalization, we start seeing these different types of mead in different places. And here you can see really truly uh, in this map what I talked about of that um, the aspect of mead making and where mead was common that's based not just on geography, but on the climate. We go to the south, we go to Italy, we go to Greece, even Spain, where grapevines grow very well. That's an easy source of sugar. They don't, they'll use their honey for other things. And they're more, de and they're, they're more developed there's a little less wild growing honey. But then we, and then you go further north and Scandinavia has been throughout history, much of it has been too far north for bees to reliably produce more honey than they just need to live on. Because after all, when we collect honey from a hive, we either collect the excess that the bees don't need or we kill the hive and the bees by taking their winter food source. So we see this band east-west of where honey was more common and mead was a more common drink. And each of these places has different traditions for how they made their mead and what they put in it. Germany put a lot of hops in their mead just like they put in their beer. Um, it actually goes, the bittering of the hops goes quite well with the sweetness of honey, the same as it, bitter, as it goes bittering into uh, beer. England has a tradition of a lot of spiced meads. France tends to put a little less into their meads. And there's a lot, a lot more communication than you would think. There's one recipe that I've currently traced from the, the first appearance I have is in a herbal of 1570 that was published in the Netherlands and England. And I've traced it through to the late 19th century, well over 300 years. And the recipe shifts and changes. And, but it is unquestionably with the proportions and the ingredient, the same recipe. However, 
depending on how you make it from which recipe, the flavor of it can change significantly. One question being, when it says take one part of honey to five parts of water, is that by weight or by volume? Honey weighs 1.4 times as much as water does. So the difference with honey compared to water is actually quite significant. When I make it by volume, I end up with a fairly sweet spice drink. When I make it by weight, it's fermented dry and the spices come out very differently in the flavor because of that. Laura, we have a question. Um, yes. Someone's wanting, wanting to know where they can purchase mead. Okay, well, we're lucky because mead has become more popular, you actually can get it at a lot of liquor stores now. Um, it's not typically nationally shipped. Uh, I do know that you're just outside of Detroit, correct? Yes. One of the better known meaderies nationally, and I don't know their product particularly well because I'm not close enough to have drunk a lot of it, but there is a meadery in Detroit called B Nectar, N-E-K-T-A-R, that is fairly well known nationally and, and well reputed. Um, I do know that locally when I go into any larger liquor store, I can usually find some mead. One that you're likely to find is an import from Scandinavia called Viking's Blood, which is um, actually quite tasty. It's fairly sweet. Um, and it's a, but it's a fortified meat. It's been uh, fortified like port is, so it's a little higher alcohol. And um, just look, I will warn you, meat is not necessarily cheap. Honey is an expensive ingredient and it does get reflected in the, the price. Or find someone you know who's a home brewer. A lot of home brewers have made it. And it, there are, if you're familiar with any of the online ordering shipping systems, uh, Beano Shipper, I think, is one of the largest ones. I, I don't know if Michigan is a state to which you can import by mail, but they actually have a very fairly large selection of meads from around the country that can get shipped. So we do have some comments in the chat. So one person, uh, actually two people recommended sh Shrams. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, Shrams, Shrams is one of the, is probably one of the very top tier mead makers in the US. Very well reputed. I'm not sure I've ever had their stuff. There's actually a meadery near me that is one of my favorites called Moonlight Meadery. And they ship to a lot of places around the country and they're fairly well known as well. There's also St. Ambrose. Have you heard of them? I know the name. I'm, I don't, I'm pretty sure I've not had their mead. Uh, and then um, another person commented that um, Bean Actor is in Ferndale. He does a big sweeter mead. Um, and uh, Shrams must be in uh, Ferndale as well. And then Blom Meadery is in Ann Arbor and is mainly dry. Uh, carbonated okay. mead. And Vino Shipper does come to Michigan. There you go. And and honestly, I had forgotten that Shrams was in, was in Michigan. Um, I looked it up earlier today and unfortunately, uh, clearly I, I, I wasn't looking in the right place. But, <laughs> but those give you some very well reputed sources nearby. Um, and if, and this is one of the things I say, mead is hugely variable. Um, please don't if, if, if you don't, if you try something and it's not to your taste, please don't conclude that you hate mead. You probably don't you probably just haven't had one that's to your taste. Uh, it's one of the problems with the, with the huge variability of very sweet to very dry, you know, sessionable five, six percent alcohol to wine strength or more, very strong flavors. For instance, my husband, I love meads with big, huge spice flavors, you know, like a strong ginger, you know, gingerbread cookie. And he, he's like, no, not too much, yuck. <laughs> um, and and I, I make a mead with quince uh, that is very sharp, very dry. It's like a summer lemonade, um, not a winter drink at all. 
quickly, we had one last comment, um, and forgive me for mispronouncing everything, but um, Kunhen makes mead as well as does dragon mead, and often witches hat, which is here in South Lyon, um, oh. has mead. And there's many liquor stores that c carry mead, like you said, Laura. Yeah, <laughs> and and that's actually a good point. You'll you'll find some uh, of some beers that have some honey in them. It's actually a very old form called a braggot. And um, those can be very tasty. And you, you might see some of them as we go into the winter, you'll see some people who make a heavier beer with some honey and spices, which is a marvelous combination. And here, here we go, other things you can add to meads, flowers, hops, roses. Uh, I mentioned Philippendula, which is called mead sweet or meadow sweet because one of the ways we've learned about very old meads is, is through this art, through archaeology, where you take ceramics or, 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 or other materials and you extract what's soaked into them from their use. And then you use uh, high-end high, uh, chromatography and other methods to identify what those ingredients were. Or one of my favorite things, you get people to literally take it and count and identify the pollen grains. And from the identification of the individual pollen grains, you can surmise what went into it. Now, I, I, that's, I'm not sure that would be my favorite job, but I'm really glad someone has done it. We also see people using clove gilla flowers, which are carnations, marigolds, violets, the color things, change the color of it. Um, now get back to our history, the age of exploration. Now things get interesting. People are going more places. They're importing more things. They're learning science. And we start seeing the world around us differently. The second quote here is from Andre Feve from 1568, where he's, he's on a voyage to uh, France Antarctique, which, what's that? No, it's not Antarctica. It's actually an old name for Brazil. And somehow in this travelogue, speaking of his voyage from Portugal to Brazil, he ends up talking about Madagascar. And I still haven't figured out how you get to Madagascar on the way between Portugal and Brazil. But he speaks of nuts of India, I eat coconuts, and making a mead from coconut milk and honey. I haven't tried that yet. Uh, I'm not, it might be interesting. And to, and to go with that, we have a picture of a very popular 16th century high class item. It's a cup made from a coconut shell, which of course was very rare and high, high, you know, high status at the time. And it was also believed to be good against poison. So you'll see in many museum collection, these fancy uh, coconut cups that are carved and placed in. Uh, so braggots we talked about, briefly. Um, science, we start seeing, figuring out the world around us. And, we, and you see in the 17th century, you start seeing bottles where you can close things off and store them more safely. Although even then they talk about, be careful that you tie the tops on securely so they don't fly. They had a habit of putting things in bottles before it was done fermenting. And if you know anything about fermentation, yeast eat sugar and they produce alcohol. But the other thing they, they produce along sugar goes to alcohol energy and CO2, which is what carbonates our beer. But if you put it in a bottle before it's done, the bottles can explode. You need to be careful. We also see interesting things like in, it's in 1680 that yeast is first observed under a microscope. And the illustration on this page is actually that, that or a similar early microscope. We see all sorts of interesting things happening, politics and economics driving what people are drinking. You see in the 17th century, a host of rules in England about Spanish and French imports of wine depending on who they were at war with at the time, they would increase the taxes or ban entirely importation of drinks from one place or another. You also see 
sugar coming in. As, as, as in the 16th century, we, we hit that inflection point between honey being she cheaper than sugar to sugar being cheaper than honey. And the world changes quite a bit because of that, especially having to do with mead. And the other thing we see that's very interesting in the 17th and 18th centuries, which has been getting a lot of attention in the last 10 years, are what we call household manuscripts. And I liken this to everyone raise, you know, everyone go nod your head yes. You, know, you have three by five note cards or pieces of paper in your kitchen. And, you know, Aunt Sue's uh, carrot muffins or Uncle Fred's uh, uh, cake for this. This was a very common thing in that time where they would buy an empty book and they would start writing in recipes for food and for medicine. Because at that time, the mostly a woman in charge of the household would also be in charge of the health of the family. So they would write down, you know, my, my cousin John, when he was ill with the gripe, took this mixture and was better. And those books carry this institutional knowledge that was passed back and forth through networks of, and social networks. And they're a fascinating study um, because they show the real life of people. One of the largest collections of these in the world is at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC, which uh, studies all things about the life of Shakespeare's time. And the vast majority of those have been placed online in full um, fully scanned online, and they just uh, a couple years ago finished a crowdsourced transcription project where they would get people to log on and type in, like here, to make white metheglin, take three gallons and a half of water, and using that, multiple people doing that, and their experts. They have, they have put online as well the modern, as in machine readable, transcriptions of those uh, manuscripts. And some of these things are not anything you would like to eat. One of the things that were popular was snail water. Um, it was supposed to be very healthy. I think I'll pass. But a, a surprising number of these books contain recipes for meads and other drinks. Uh, which I have collected quite a number of. You know, as we say, so now we're getting to the 18th century and things are getting remarkably close to the modern age. They're using techniques to make their, their drinks that we recognize, their racking, which is the process of taking the drink off of the sediment of the yeast. They're worried about their, the casks, the barrels they're using being clean and healthy. They're adding things that help the yeast be happier and produce alcohol. They're controlling the temperature. They're, uh, a hydrometer is a tool that brewers use to tell how much sugar is in their liquid. It tells you basically how much potential you have to make alcohol. And starting in the 14th century, they use a fresh laid hen's egg as a way of testing the density of a liquid. Interestingly enough, a fresh laid hen's egg, and you say fresh laid because as an egg sits out in the air, actually uh, air does get through that shell and into the egg and it gets lighter over time. But a fresh laid hen's egg has a density that is about midway between the starting point of beer and the starting point of wine. So actually a nice point to make an alcoholic drink from. And they worry about oxygen getting in and they have, now they did drink a lot of things probably which we would, we would uh, put down the sink instead of drinking. Uh, they didn't have as much leisure as we do, but we see that science. And then I stop about 1750 when we're really getting scientific and we're pulling the new world into things and, and life is just getting a little bit more modern, a little bit too modern for my taste. So I've talked some about these recipes, and I thought I'd show an example here of what I look at when I'm reading a recipe. This is a translation from the French of a recipe that was written in a 1600 
French book, uh, Théâtre d'Agriculture. So it's a book about running a farm. And you can see I've highlighted some of these things. One part of good honey and 12 of rainwater. But if you go to the yellow down below, you can say, well, maybe you can put in more honey. Then you say, common barrels of clean wood. Well, is that a brand new barrel, which is going to add some wood taste? Or is it a barrel that's been sitting around for a couple of years, you've used it 20 times and it's got yeah, nothing left in it? You can add cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, pepper, ginger, or other spices, whatever you like. You can add elder, choose all these choices. So this is, what do I think about when I'm making a mead from this recipe? And I've used this recipe in a couple of different permutations and I can make it in a huge variety of ways. Um, so what I was hoping to do is, uh, I'm hoping there's some questions so we can get some conversation going. Uh, or if people would like me to just share more, I can talk about some aspect of this additionally. I, I love this history because the history of what people did and how they did it is the history of the world to me, not who was ruling and who was at war with who, but how people lived their lives and what they did. And we can look at these recipes and get insight into what was important to them, what their life was, how they thought. And then we can have the fun of trying to figure out what it meant and how it was done and, and making it. Now, when I say making it, often brewers don't want to, they say, well, what, you're just gonna make it in an open thing and leave it out in the yard and it's gonna get disgusting. You can, you can do whatever you want. There's no rules here. There's, I, I, there's, I'm not the history police. <laughs> if you want to look at a list of ingredients and use those and use your climate control brewing and everything you do, that's great. I do know people who will literally put it in a, and put it in the backyard to catch that wild yeast and do a wild ferment. And that's not too far off. Uh, last, no, early this year, some archaeologists in Israel uh, wrote, um, published a paper where they scraped yeast out of ceramic containers that had been used to hold beer, presumably, two to 4,000 years ago, and they actually revitalized that yeast. And they found six or seven different yeasts and used them to make beer. And out of the six or seven, they found three that tasted pretty good, one that was okay, and three that were no, 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 no. So the funny thing is, out of those four that they thought tasted pretty good, only one of them, when they typed the yeast and figured out exactly what variety it was, was actually the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is used for the vast majority of fermentation in the modern day. Three of them were other yeast varieties, other yeast um, species. So this, it's, it's, in some ways that's the picture of the modern world where instead of the 900 varieties of apples that are named and described in a late 19th century British book on apples, so that's only British apples, 900 of them. When we go, when we go around today, we have a dozen kinds of apples that are the bulk of the apples grown and eaten in the United States. So let's look at some of that and, and see that variety and how it, can, how it can impact what we do. Or just think about different ways of looking at the world. Um, the last is, as I say, I've got a couple of books out there and I really want to say thank you to all those institutions that have put this material, made this material available in so many different ways um, and easily accessible so that people can look at it and see it and learn from it. Uh, and then the last is all, all of the illustrations used here are either pictures I've taken myself or images that have been made freely available for use by the public by a variety of institutions. And thank you to all of them. <laughs>
So do we have some more questions? Oh, actually, I have a question for you, Laura. What, what is your favorite recipe that you have made? And then what's your favorite mead that you have ever tasted by somebody else? Oh. I think the, my favorite meads I've tasted by someone else are, um, that's a tough one. <laughs> I'd have to say I, I really enjoy meads that I have with with spices, and um, because they're local to me, I've I've had a bunch of the ones made by Moonlight Meadery, and they make a apple and spice one, which is actually fairly widely available, called Kurt's Apple Pie. That's quite good. Mm. Um, and as for the ones that I make, that's one of my faves. Honestly, I think my current favorite is what I call virtuous quince mead, because the original recipe says, and to make it more virtuous in quince time, you should add some quince juice. And I love it because quince is not only a fruit that most people have heard the name of, but very few people have tasted. That's very fairly uncommon today. And I'm fortunate enough, I, I live in New England, and a friend of ours lives on a late 17th, early 18th century farmstead in Western Massachusetts that has quince bushes. Now I'm sure the bushes are not nearly as old as the farmstead, but again, it's that connection and that continuity. And a few years ago, I went out and harvested a whole bunch of quinces and juiced them. So I'm using that juice from a 300 year old farmstead to make a 400 year old recipe that has this wonderful light, um, quince is very, very tart. It's basically inedible raw. Um, so the juice you add to a gallon of liquid, you add about a cup of quince juice, which doesn't sound like much, but you get this wonderful bright tart flavor with the honey and, um, and it doesn't come out very high alcohol. It's usually about seven or eight percent, so you can you have a nice glass and it's a wonderful summer drink coming off of summer. Um, but that's the connection, you know, that connection, that idea that you're 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 recreating the the past. You're you're looking this through this window uh, and bringing it forward. So, uh, what need would you recommend to somebody who maybe is just uh, starting to explore what's out there? Do you think there's one that they should start with? You know, honestly, the, the melomels, the ones with fruits are always a good place to start. Um, and then just pay attention to whether you're getting something that's, whether you want something that's sweeter or drier, and then try to aim for that. Because if you're ex expecting, if you want something sweet, if you like something sweet, and you go get something that's made with, for instance, black currants, which are very tart. You're just not going to get what you expect. Uh, and it, and that's a hard question for me because I tend to like a little bit of both, the very sweet and the much and the drier. But for a lot of people, it's 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 you really like you know it's like people who like one kind of beer and not another. For instance, I am not an IPA person. Uh, I like hops fine. But when you put it in enough hops to make it an IPA, it's like, no, no, thank you. I'll, I'll have something else. <laughs> I appreciate it, but it, it doesn't uh, make me happy. Actually, that was going to be my next question. I mean, what would you recommend to somebody who prefers more like pale or ales or um, IPAs or the more hearty beers? Yeah, it, it, it's really, a, it is exactly that. It's a matter of matching in but this, this is true of, of, any, of any kind of drink, whether it's wine or beer or mead or cider, is you have to know what you like and find, find, some, find something that matches what you like. And I, 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 when, I, when I'm giving people things, I, I said, you said earlier, I made over a hundred of these. I usually make about a half a gallon, which is, which is five 12 ounce bottles, and then I taste it. Anyone who comes to my house is likely to get served mead and to 
and said, tell me what you think. Do you like that one? What do you like? But what I always say to people is, you're always allowed to say, this was not to my, I didn't like this. But trust me, I'm not going to serve you anything that is bad. So don't say this is bad because that's just not going to be true. It may not be to your taste. So understand what it's, 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 and a lot of people try to make this a big, I am not a fancy dancy wine tea. A lot of people try to make this into a big mysterious thing. Oh, it has a hint of, oh, I can pull out the, the, uh, the phenols from that particular yeast species. And some people really are tasting that, but don't get, it's, it's, don't get put aside by that. Learn what you like, put it in whatever words you can. I like it sweet, I don't like it sweet. I like lots of flavor and I don't like lots of flavor. These are all things that any, you know, the people can work with. Define what you like. You know, it's, it, it's, so there isn't any hard advice. Unfortunately, because the mead world is less clearly established, you can go into the liquor store, but you'll probably have a choice of four or five meads as opposed to what? Sometimes it feels like four or 500 beers. I know it's not quite that many, but it feels like it. So it's a, we don't quite have as much to work with. Uh, so it's a little harder to, to help people find things, especially when you don't have, you know, if, if I have my, my boxes of meat in front of me, I can go find something. Um, I, I, I wish it was a little more helpful. Well, I don't see any questions from our, um, our participants. So I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight, and especially you, Laura, for, um, for teaching us about need, how it's uh, made, and the history of it. So I want to thank you so much for everything you shared with us tonight. And I always have tons of questions, so I could probably keep talking all night. But uh, Go ahead I, if you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> I actually was curious what you would recommend to somebody who may want to start making their own meat. Like, what would be the most simple um, tools that you would need to get started? You know, meat, meat making is not that hard. Uh, your best place to start is with a gallon, a, a, you know, recommend a glass gallon jug. Because making, making less than a gallon is, is, if it works out, you've said, oh, there's not much. A glass gallon jug, some honey, frankly, any kind, you know, the bare minimum is something that you can clean very well because remember when you're fermenting you're trying to make an environment with lots of food in which a microorganism the yeast is happy to grow and thrive well unfortunately if the yeast is happy to grow and thrive every other microorganism in the world is also happy to grow and thrive and most of them you're not really that interested in so keeping clean is very important so if there, you can look, home, most homebrew stores have starting kits. You don't necessarily have to get, but if they're for a beer that's five gallons at a time, you don't want, so get a container you can clean adequately and keep closed. So that top, you're, you need to, uh, what we call a fermentation lock, which basically lets air out, but not back in. So it's usually a, a, a S curve or something with water in it so that the air, the CO2 as it made bubbles out, but nothing comes back in. You need honey, you need water, and you, you need yeast. And this is where I vary from a lot of brewers out there. A lot of brewers out there will tell you things like, oh no, you can't make decent mead with bread yeast. Nonsense, in my opinion. If, if you go and get a brewing yeast, you'll have a little bit more surety of results. Think of some flavors you like, add a little bit of it. Avoid things like powdered spices or powdered herbs. If you're gonna add cinnamon, add a stick of cinnamon and then you, when you can smell it or you think there's, take it out. Uh, there's, you can get absurdly, it's like any hobby like anything that people do at all different levels. You can get very complicated. You can control everything about it. 
or you can just start out by trying, which is what most people do. There's a lot of information available online. And if you keep in mind that you want to know, you want to have a good guess that you're going to get the flavor you want. You need to stay very clean and you, you don't want to have too much or too little sugar to start with. So with honey, a, with honey, a typical mead is going to be two and a half to three pounds of honey per gallon total of volume. Uh, a lot of the recipes I use go as low as two. If you go that, if you go lower, you can pretty much guarantee that you're not going to have any sugar left. It's not going to be a sweet meat. And if you're not using some of these more, more well-known methods to control your fermentation, it's possible it could end up not going very well. It does happen sometimes. But try it. It's not that difficult of an experiment. It's, you know, anyone who's made kombucha has done this. You know, if you've made, uh, frankly, as I said earlier, if you have a sourdough starter and you've made sourdough bread, you're doing something that's essentially at its core fermentation. Yeast consumes the grains and generates the gas that makes your bread light and airy. Is that all that different? <laughs> all right well thank you so much laura if anyone has any questions the time is um time to ask them is now but if there aren't any i want to thank you all for joining us tonight don't forget to click that little link to take the survey for um for uh feedback on tonight's program and any ideas you'd like to see in the future and again thanks so much for joining us thank you it's been a pleasure all right, I don't see any more questions, so I'm going to wish you all a very good night, and I'm going to end the meeting. So everyone, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. <laughs>